Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being with us in this, we we'll say, the closing section session of the uh, meeting on architecture. The final figures of the number of visitors is 275,000 plus 14,000 during the Venissage. The interesting figure is that 50% have been visitors under 26 years of age. The, we have been trying to speak to architects, to speak to visitors, to induce uh, thoughts, new thoughts, new opening of minds in all those who have been walking through this exhibition curated by uh, Yvonne and Shelley, with, which, with whom I would like to just have a short conversation about something we have possibly left over, we didn't uh, deal before. I mean, uh, if this is the final hour of the exhibition, so we'll either we say it now or we shall shut up forever. Sounds dangerous, Paolo. First chapter. I would like to start from, not from the main theme of the exhibition, but for a second line, a line that links the last three biennales. Uh, since for, for curators, the biennale is one, for us, there's a chain of biennale. I must say that even for curators, is a chain and they feel that they belong to a sort of progress or a, a series of ways in, in which, by which the, the architecture can be seen, so a different point of view. Um, and the, the theme I'd like to introduce is technology. Technology, uh, we have had a, a, an exhibition curated by Rem Kolas, uh, based on the information, somehow dramatic information, that technology is taking over. The space, the room which is left to the architect is less and less. The architect is asked to draw by the mean of a computer an envelope of elements which are of technical origin or are to be considered technical. Uh, and the the pessimistic view of that uh, Biennale was, of course, um, left us with some more questions about the question that we have already faced before. Does a room for architecture still exist? The, uh, then we had Aravena, Aravena's Biennale of Architecture with uh, talking about technology, but seen from an incredibly positive uh, point of view, provided that it's clear that the last technology is not necessarily the best one. We have left with a very large range of choices. And uh, the, the Giardini, uh, the, the, the Padiglione Centrale, the, the, the first installation were, was made of bricks. You, we know that is a, is a theme. This is the, the relationship between technology and the different disciplines of, of the Biennale is, of course, a uh, matter of, of our attention. Artists do not care about technology. For artists, whatever is the development of computer, a brush and a color may perfectly uh, do and may perfectly satisfy the need. But for architecture, this was a bit more uh, a tricky question. I mean, uh, Aravena started saying and wanted to participate to this Biennale, saying the problem is the phenomenology, the problem is the capability to put questions, to have an idea of what we want and what we desire, and then go on finding solutions that will. Uh, use any possible technology according to the place, according to the costs, according to the society, according to the economy. 
And so technology came in as an, an instrument for adaptation. For, to, uh, there is a choice, there are choices. I must say that this Biennale by you seems to be a Biennale in which technology, what is technology? Do you see any technology in here? We see, we see wood, any possible material, any possible stuff, any possible... So the pro possibly the, the, this Biennale is about shape, shapes, and the space is something that brings back, talking, starting from the space, we are back to architecture that helps us in shaping the space in which we live, be it the private or be it the public. So tell me your attitude about your work and technology and how technology fits in this Biennale or is not necessarily a fundamental question of your. Um, I think our approach probably stems from an attitude to time, which is that uh, in architecture, time is not linear. It's more a spiral. And I think in culture, we believe that the, uh, the ancient is as present as the future. And that we have to, as practicing architects, weave time into the way that we make spaces. Everybody loves spaces like these buildings in, uh, here in the Arsenale, because there is the patina of time. And in the making of new buildings, I, I agree, I actually do think that architecture is very much of the time under threat and there is very little scope. And I think the, um, Rem Colas making that case has a case to make because every day of our practicing lives, we have this tide of, of possibilities coming at us in terms of how we should use materials. And we're continually resisting uh, so much of what is uh, commonly used because we believe in craft and we believe in the tactile quality of architecture. And we, you speak about brick as being in the entrance to the, um, to the, the Aravena uh, show in the central pavilion. And many architects are using ancient materials in a highly sophisticated way where they're mixing uh, contemporary technology with ancient means or rediscovering the sophistication of uh, the archaic, let's say, and rediscovering that and trying to find ways of, of using it and reinterpreting it. So uh, I, I think it does absolutely exist as a pressure to, uh, to squeeze out the possibility of making buildings which have a sense of craft and a sense of the tactile and the haptic sense, and, and that's the world that we're operating in. But one of the things we felt was really important was to find architects around the world who managed to sidestep that, to get around, to find the cracks in the system, because we're operating in the very small cracks in the system, to find ways of making buildings which have that sensual, uh, physical, haptic uh, quality. And I, I think one of the things we've really enjoyed about this Biennale is that, and, and I think many people have seen it and seen it at the meetings on architecture and the way that people uh, present their work. Yesterday we saw Rafael Moneo making a winery out of concrete mixed with iron in Spain, and we saw the woman in China making, um, Chen Chen making um, bamboo theatres, and invention, uh, the invention of architects, I think, is limitless, actually, if given the scope. So we were trying to find like-minded people who supported that position, let's say. And so in this, um, in this Biennale. I think probably technology also is, is something to be embraced. It's not something that one is afraid of. We all use computers. It's, uh, we have to use technology. It's, it's part of our lives. But we also have to hold on to what's 
what's valuable, what kind of materials and what kind of way of building makes the human being feel connected uh, with their world. When, when you ask about technology, Paolo, just outside the door here is a fantastic uh, piece from Vietnam where all the material, it's really one material of bamboo. And in Vietnam, what they are really saying is that bamboo is the new steel. And that technology doesn't mean uh, alienation, doesn't mean huge uh, uh, distancing, because as Shell says, that technology is, if you like, for the benefit of us. All of us have iPhones, we text each other, we are uh, in, in a different kind of communication now. But I think what is interesting is that in the range of people and architects that we have uh, in, uh, invited in the Biennale, that we were really trying to uh, say technology is part of, the, part of the spectrum of reality, but that in the end, that uh, we are human beings sitting in the same, if you look at the throne of Tutankhamun, it's the same size as the plastic chair you're sitting in, that as human beings, well, you've probably look better in that one, Paolo, than two of them come. But it's the uh, human element of, uh, of this place uh, that we wanted to um, have in the Biennale. And the spectrum, I, I found that in terms of technology and information, that you also need time to meditate. When people sit on the, the timber bench made by uh, um, Moneo, you can read the text and spend time. That the technology that we've actually used with, with your team here in, in the Biennale, the technology that made the words become clouds on the, on the ceiling, the kind of hidden technology. I think it's not in your face technology, it's using uh, light, the lighting, your lighting team, working with our team have made, I think, absolutely beautiful atmosphere. So the technology is there, it's lighting, it's uh, uh, it's those wonderful um, projections. The ancient drawings, as you, when you come in through the ropes and you come into that room where Sebastiano have found these beautiful Venetian drawings, that those drawings are ancient and they're projected onto the wall. They're not actual drawings, they're projected. So I think we have tried to weave technology into the kind of seams between things. And it's not about huge amounts of facts that you have to, um, uh, if you like, understand before you know something. We wanted people to be curious and to not know. And there was a curatorial decision um, when we worked with Hugh Campbell in the uh, in, um, Close Encounter. And there was a big debate among us as a team whether we put all the information on each of the exhibits. And we chose to not put information, but to put the information a little bit away. So if you really wanted to, understand in more academic depth, you could go there. But the physicality of mooching around these things and finding something attractive and trying to understand in yourself as a person, why do I find that one and what is that, rather than being fed information. So I think what we've tried to do is the span has included technology and it's not ignored, but it's not a it's not a laser of information that you're bombarded with. We try to keep it at a level where people had enjoyment first, had the physical relationship with a piece of uh, explaining architecture, like the technology, say in the in the in the building in um, in uh, for the the children's uh, the oval in Tokyo. That's a standard model which architects have made for centuries, but they have used a drone to capture the life of the children. And that's, that's modern, okay, drones were probably developed for warfare and we now have them for, uh, if you like, pleasure. But, the, but the, the overlap of contemporary technology of the drone with the voices of those Japanese children whom we will never know, but we can hear their squeals of delight as they slide from roof to ground, how they take risks in this building. I think in technology has been used in a very subtle way, but it's not technology as we're going forward and the future is, you know, information. These are all inventions that we have tried to weave into the story of this Biennale. Thank you. Chapter number two, uh, Genesis. <laughs> That's one. 
Uh, this is one. I mean, but that was a, that was a un, un preambolo. The genesis of the Biennale. Well, uh, it is almost a couple of years that I rang you for the first time. Then we met, and I've been asking you whether you are ready to consider the idea of uh, curating a Biennale of architecture. And um, in, with, with, this, with that very act, and that very question, I am sure I have introduced a process of a metamorphosis because you, you, your business is not curating. You are architects and your profession is being architects. And so to become a curator requires a sort of um, some transformation of attitudes and some transformation of, if, certainly from the point of view, of things. Um, then you have to, we have been offering you the possibility to have these sites, these two big sites, the white cube, Giardini site of the Padiglione Centrale and this impressive theatrical space in the Arsenale. And then we have given you the challenge of imagining what on earth is an exhibition of architecture. A question that is there, still there, but it is always there whenever an architect or a curator in general start thinking of it. What is an exhibition of architecture? The model we follow is the exhibition of art, but in the exhibition of art, the objects that are shown as a result of the work of the artist. Here we cannot show the actual results of the works of the architects. So what are we going to show? Models, photos, or objects that somehow indirectly reveals, reveal thoughts, the way of thinking, messages, ideologies, uh, interest. Uh, those objects are uh, are there to uh, translate thinking into images and for the visitor the problem is transforming once again images into thoughts. So the, this brings about uh, the necessity to talk to your colleague, to colleagues <laughs> from a completely, completely different point of view from, from what you have been accustomed since that moment. You have to ask something to your colleagues, you have to discuss with them what they are going to show, and you become a curator, like a curator of art, where the choice becomes the very uh, difficult uh, step. This is possibly that's the most difficult step while curating. And then, uh, what is a Biennale for? Uh, the Biennale is a machine, I call the Biennale the machine of desire, which means that through all these visions and the, the opening of minds of the visitors that the images can induce uh, more understanding, but also, I hope, more desire for architecture, having realized that architecture is a tool for empowering ourselves or empowering our civil society. So my, our hope is that the machine of desire works, but for a curator, that's an incredible, once again, a difficult point to face. How do we? And it, with many of your colleagues, since, I mean, among architects, usually uh, the, the energy that goes around is jealousy of each other because, I mean, there's, architects are jealous of, of each other more like the opera sopranos. Uh, that, uh, but that is a mo there is a moment in which you have to talk to your colleagues, ask, pretend, discuss, and sometimes broke a friendship. Uh, break a friendship. So it's... Um, uh, and then it, the Biennale lasts six months. It's not a Congress of Architecture. Congress of Architecture is three days. A conference, a couple of days. Three months, what, what does it mean? That we are organizing an exhibition for the public, 
for the visitors, not only for architects. Visitors, so we want to speak to them, we want to talk to them, we want to offer opportunity to see, in a, from a different point of view, the, all the possibilities and the opportunities that architecture can offer us. Uh, what is the Biennale of Architecture? I'd like to start with uh, saying, Paolo, that when you talk about friendships and breaking of friendships, I think that that is not what we had in mind. It was one of the, one of the hardest things, I think, for Shelley, myself and our team, is to choose from the community of architects around the world samples. And that, that was hard. We had to leave out people whose work we really respect, and it was hard. And I think that, I suppose I'm emotional because you know that around the world that there are people who are marvelous. But it's like having a table and there's only so many people can sit around the table. So it's like choosing a team. You have to take the best left winger or whatever to play. But that doesn't mean that there aren't 10 sitting on a bench ready to come. So it's really, I think that what we have experienced as being, first of all, getting this phone call out of the blue from you and we said it's either we haven't taken the chairs from our last exhibition or they want us to do something that was our reaction to knowing you were on the end of the phone because it came as a surprise a true surprise and we are at the end of that surprise and it has been an incredible uh, experience but the being asked to be curators i think what is interesting is that it's an architectural exhibition, and why the hell would you not ask architects to be the curators of an architectural exhibition? Because curating or this uh, platform here in Venice is really saying architecture is worthwhile, this is what it is. What we've been trying to do is to say this is what it is. It's a chair. It's uh, keeping the, the uh, Atlantic Ocean out of New York. It's many things. It's not possible to say that architecture is this and that. It is everything. So that's what you, when you ask about a curation, I think what we did then is that we made the very difficult choices and we had colleagues helping us, like architectural spies, finding wonderful people we didn't know and remembering wonderful people we did know and having to make difficult choices of the numbers of people because you can only fit, so even though it's a big venue, you still have a numbers issue. Even though we made the corderie uh, and the ateliere that we have stuffed it, if you like, giving it its maximum capacity, and we have made the rooms, the 22 or so rooms in the uh, central pavilion, as full as possible, you still have to edit. So we had to edit down like a, like a recipe to get the purest, if you like, expression of the community of architecture. And it's not about people individuals. I think that what we have tried to do is to say that architecture is a collective. And in the Irish language there's a word called mehel, which is in far farming parlance really, that if we have a big farm side by side and you, your crop is cut, you come and help us and then we help each other. I think that that's the spirit of what we wanted to do in this Biennale, that architects around the world uh, come together to say this is architecture not architects, this is architecture. And we try to make it so that you would sit in a funny seat, you would push a certain thing, you would sit, you would walk. That architecture is the ordinary made beautiful, not something extraordinary separate from society. You asked us, and the challenge you said to us, really, you know, communicate it, uh, communicate the value of architecture, make it beautiful, what is beautiful. But the ordinary is beautiful, the light, in, in, the, in the film, the light here in Venice, in the reflection, that architecture isn't the, if you like, the zone of the wealthy. You don't have to be in a palace to experience beauty. It can be the water of Venice, the reflection of light, the ability to sit and discuss on a bench. So I think what we were trying to do, and I think that that's what we, walking today, watching the promenade of people on this uh, walkway, say here in the, in the Corderie, and watching people sitting on a bench, the human, having a discussion, that's for us a wonderful achievement. So I think it's because we're architects and that architecture, all the people in this room, 
instinctively love architecture because it's the beauty of human creation within the earth, that that's what we've been trying to do. Not curation as a feather, as Corb used to say, a feather in a woman's hat. It's not a kind of a thing you do and, oh, it's curated. It's a terribly serious dialogue, a physical dialogue with society. And I think we, we hadn't heard, probably we should have, your description before we met you that um, the Biennale is a, a machine of desire, which sounds kind of open-ended and very interesting and very Italian and <laughs> just about respectable. And <laughs> we, we interpret it in other ways, you know, usually. But anyway, that's what it is. And what we thought was fantastic was, was that challenge you, you, you gave to us. You know, you, you have to grow desire. You have to grow the desire for architecture. And you talk about yourself being an economist and there's, um, there's supply and demand. So if you, want to, if you want space to operate as architects in the world, you have to create the demand. You describe that in a very simple way. And we had never thought about that before. <clears throat> quite in that way, and it made us. I think once after, uh, once we had made the choice of people, which took us about six months, and Ivan is right, that was the most difficult thing. And also, you can't make a good exhibition if you don't have the right ingredients. You need the people to respond to uh, to the challenge in the way that we were trying to respond to the challenge. But what we found was that we were very. Um, honest and direct with the participants if they were not communicating in a way that we felt would communicate their work which we valued and they valued if it was not being communicated in a way which was legible to everybody. And, and that was interesting because sometimes architects are their own worst enemies. They don't know what they want to say and they don't know how to say it. And it's very difficult. And we knew the difficulty because we've exhibited it. I think having exhibited in the, in here in, in 2012 really taught us a lot about how you have to distill an idea, you have to keep it simple and you have to communicate it. So there was a lot of actually very positive, usually, engagement between the participants and, and our team, especially. It, just getting uh, to the point where the project really communicated. And that was really pushed by, by your wish to communicate not just to other architects, and our wish to communicate to, to as many people as possible. By the way, one of the uh, projects of yours I've been mm, looking at and careful it is, of course, the Bocconi building and what struck me was your, uh, the dualism that you bring in that building, which is a massive, very important sort of uh, gray building, but then with a big eye of transparency and the in, an internal white that seems to say we are here at the same time. You are inside and I am outside. So the in and the out are there so clearly uh, uh, presented to, as the dualism of a dialogue. And I may say that uh, that was a mm, rather interesting. I, I saw in this exhibition some other projects that have inspired by the same sort of principle of in and out. Uh, the building starts, I do not know where it starts and where it ends. The, uh, and this, of course, brought you to the idea of public space or better to free space. But in, in any case, we are back to the dualism between private and public and architecture as a sort of veil that can be veil that can allow us to, to cross and to between what is definitely private and what is definitely public meaning by that not me and the other side of the world 
but me uh, in private life and me in the public life. So I mean, always considering the many we that are in each of us and uh, architecture to be considered an art by which you underline the complexity and the multiplicity that is in us giving to each side of our com complex personality an area, a place, a space where to uh, be sheltered or be active, where to be private or to be free. So I mean this uh, private and public and then we have been discussing about this uh, and you've made a choice, a very courageous choice because I've been always telling that for an economist public good is a precise definition is, it has a specific meaning. A private good is a good that by its own nature cannot be a matter of exchange in the market. Because the, the use by one doesn't make it scarce for other, which is a precisely definition of free space. The use of, 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 for, from each of us of the space in which we live or at least up to a certain point, doesn't make its case for others. Uh, but the having public space and obtaining free space, either it's, since it's a public good, either it says it's the result of the generosity of someone, or it's the result of the social action or action of institutions, public institutions that do uh, intervene with public resources to obtain the free space, you chose to underline this, this first. Once again, we are, we are facing a dualism, but you chose with a great courage to choose the, one of these two uh, possibilities, the generosity of either of possibly of architects, but also the generosity of the, of the, of, of the commissioner, uh, which is uh, a step towards what many comment, commentators might have considered utopian. Anytime we ask the generosity of the others to help in producing results, we are accused of being utopians. How do you feel about this? suspicion of being utopian. I like it. <laughs> I think suspicion of being utopian is a lovely phrase. Um, I, I'm just thinking as you're speaking, um, Daniel Barenboim uh, talks, he says the nature of music is inexplicable except through sound. And in a way, I think the nature of architecture, we say, is inexplicable except through space. But in order to make a true architectural space, generosity is at the core. So the point we were, I suppose, trying to make <clears throat> was yes to do with the generosity of the architect and yes to do with the generosity of the powers that be that commission the architect, but also that generosity is at the core of architecture. It's not just to do with the individuals who commission or who make it. To find it, it, it has to be there. So it's actually a basic um, uh, quality, let's say, that, that uh, architecture has if and when it exists. It gives something to the human being. And we had some very interesting discussions with you, which hopefully we will tease out, because we're supposed to ask some questions as well, aren't we? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, where you, you challenged the idea of generosity, because in Italian, generosity has a connection with charity. And you, I remember, said that you thought that um, that, that, that the space that you're speaking about, the civic space, the free space, should be the right of the human being, that it should be, not be dependent on some sense of charity or, uh, um, let's say, 
somebody deciding to be generous, that, that some things are the basic right of the human being. And that was a very interesting discussion, but we couldn't find another word to describe what we were trying to say. Because it, it, many of the elements, Ivan, I think it's fair to say, when we were writing the manifesto, many of the things that we were speaking about are primarily to do with the nature of architecture, the core of architecture, and then trying to find how we could express these um, elements at the core of architecture. Like somebody saying to us, a poet friend, saying, um, light is your material, isn't it? Not how do you build buildings, but, but that's your material. And that's something very provocative, that making of architecture is, is to do with the play of light. Yes, it's, it's, it's about so many other things. But if you don't use the materials, the basic material of architecture, you don't get to the heart or to the core or to the soul of architecture. So these were the things we spoke about when we were writing that manifesto. How do you, how do you, how do you set um, an ambition uh, which deals with or, or somehow tries to tease out um, the, 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 the core qualities. And maybe the thing of, of being um, utopian is that we realized actually only through the Biennale and through talking to each other and talking about the practice of architecture is that optimism is also at the core of architecture because you're imagining a new world. How can you imagine a new world if you don't have some sense of uh, utopia or if you don't have some sense of, of optimism as to how we are imagining a future, whether it's a tiny house or, or a, a, a university, you're, you're always imagining something else and, and trying to give something back which is not requested, to try to find that additional thing, that extra thing, that extra component, which is the thing that touches the, the nerve of architecture. I think that the, the term uh, free space uh, developed from conversations about uh, the importance of moving architecture away from only the image, that it wasn't architecture as beautiful object, it was first of all space, and that we wanted space up there as the, uh, the main ingredient, that we're enclosed in these brick, uh, this uh, brick container here, and that the free was really another, a more contemporary way, it's not just free space, it's not, as we say, it's not a car park uh, available somewhere in downtown Rome, that if you put the two words together, free space, it was really a component in historic uh, terms, I suppose, is the civic component. It's the, uh, it's the aspect of other. What, because architects are actually scientists of space, they invent, even though you, that's what's amazing, say, about an architectural competition. You have exactly the same requirements in exactly the same place. And of the 10 or 20 architects, each one of them, if you like, or each one of the teams, uh, produces an incredible invention. So every uh, project is an invention. And what we wanted to, if you like, to put on the table uh, for this Biennale, one was the manifesto about free space, so it was about space and not object. But we also wanted not only the samples from the architects that we invited, but that the buildings themselves would be, uh, if you like, proof of the thesis, that, that free space. When we asked you, your team, to get rid of all the partitions in the, in the Arsenale, or in the Corderie, and to see for, uh, just for itself, just for itself, that, that 300 meters, this is what 300 meters feel like. And on the ground, we put the measure of meters and we put the measure of uh, uh, the Venetian feet. And what was fantastic is to watch kids hopping along and enjoying measure and realizing that the tools of architecture are very ordinary things. The, what I love in the, in just beside the rope, uh, uh, before you go through the ropes, on the wall is the 100 meter, uh, the 1 to 100 scale version of the, of the Arsenale, of the Corderie. And it's like, it is like exactly like a scale rule, which is the, the basic tool of what architects use, dimension, uh, light, simplicity. So I think the, when you talk about utopia and you talk about, um, for us, I think it was the manifesto was also a kind of a theoretical uh, jump, 
not necessarily utopian, but we would hope that we put the two words together and then we ask the various countries to translate into their uh, into their languages. And I must say, I love the, the kind of, um, the, the sense of, I don't know what it sounds like in Indonesian, I don't know what it sounds like in Russian, but I love the fact that the word free space has tried to jump like some sort of genetic kind of mutation into other languages. And I'm sure they're badly translated in some languages and very subtly translated in others, and we'll never know. And maybe some people think it's a crazy kind of notion and separate free from space. But we've tried to shish kebab these two words into a new meaning for Venice. This is the advantage of living in a bubble tower. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Do I agree with the... Everywhere we're discussing the, we define the humanism that has been now developed in, in, uh, in this country and in Europe in the 15th, 16th century as a, a time in which disenchantment met utopia with the result of the need of creation, of urgency of creation to make the disenchantment alive or uh, fertile. Uh, so uh, the, I understand from your uh, uh, satisfaction of being utopian that you have a high, high idea of architecture as a challenge to creation, to imagining, to create in an urgency to do that. I mean, so this is the, I'm back with the idea of desire. I mean, uh, you know, I'm possibly because I'm Italian, but I'm back with the idea that desire is really the main fire that allow us to be disenchanted at the same time utopians. Um, chapter four. Teaching and communicating. You are not only great architects, but highly appreciated teachers. So you teach architecture. And you, while teaching, you use words, sometimes images, but I mean, mainly words. As we said, the Biennale is um, not a teaching. Uh, institutions or a place, but it's a place where you have to communicate. We have to, to communicate, not just to inform. And here we are back to the idea of the Biennale is a place where people is anxious to go, not to get information, but to get knowledge, which means information plus the direct experience of what is in front of us and the direct challenges that each work that we see produces on us. So to make information develop into knowledge or into a wider capability of understanding, a wider expansion of our eyes or expansion of our mind. Uh, so there is, these are two different tools by which we transfer somehow knowledge and uh, energy. Um, what do you feel about this, having as, as teachers, to have, have had in your hands a completely different tool for, a, for informing and forming and implementing others' knowledge, uh, in, particularly in the, new, the uh, new generations of architects? Uh, did you find that, to, they find that there are two different worlds? Do you find there are similarities you have been inviting a lot of young architects that have been working with teachers. So teaching has become, in this Biennale, a main argument, a main theme uh, among all the others. Why is that? Uh, I think it's because we believe that it's at the core of the continuity of the culture of architecture and that practicing architects teach or work with young architects to 
explore in parallel with the Yvonne often talks about the fact that as architects we're somewhere we're between business and culture and so we operate within quite pressured uh, let's say conditions in our day-to-day -day world and then we teach which means we can play we can explore with students we can discover we can research um, uh, things we would never get the opportunity to research in our own offices. We can be renewed by young people who don't have the language but have the right questions. We can transfer, if accepted, our values or our, um, our beliefs. They can change our values or our be beliefs by virtue of their response to our questions. So it's a cultural uh, kind of con continuum which is beneficial to both, we think. And we also think it's beneficial to this idea of architecture having a real sense of continuity and a sense of, um, of, of time less and, and that that's important, that the tradition and the continuity of, of architecture is important. Um, I'm intrigued by your definition, which you just kind of drop on us at lunchtime, that humanism comes out of disenchantment meeting um, utopia. Where did you get that from? <laughs> ordinary schools and um, ordinary reading of what we have been doing in the past. When he, when he, when he uses his tie like this, he's becoming pedagogical, let's say. <laughs> no, seriously. I don't think I was born with it, but more or less I was grown with, with these concepts. No, but where did it come from? Was it before lunch? Was it a breakfast? <laughs> no, it's, it's, a, it's a fantastic description. I'm really curious. That the disenchantment, meeting yes. utopia, yes. leads to humanism. Yes. I mean, no, 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 this is not the... the, the if, if you dig deep into what humanism has been in the, in the, in the beginning of the Renaissance, uh, you, you really see that why, why that period was so uh, eager to create. Because that was the beginning of the disenchantment, relatively to values of the Middle Age and so on. Disenchantment led to feel that uh, you were alone and uh, God was somewhere, but then the challenge was to your capability to create. The urgency to create was a way to escape disenchantment, if you want, or to, co to give a sense to life being disenchanted about the possibilities that uh, are to be uh, met or obtained by nature, from nature or from other human beings. Uh, Machiavelli wrote a book about this. Hmm? I mean, uh, this is at least what we uh, consider humanism. Uh, then, of course, you have two different shades of humanism, different possible emphasis. There is a humanism that was still linked to religion, to faith, but uh, don't tell me that all those Madonnas were act of faith. They were creating an image. They were creating a, 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 a sort of human being, a creating an utopia by painting, by sculpture, by architecture, by philosophy. So, I mean, it's... Uh, uh, but it's interesting because I, I had a short conversation, I don't know if he's here today, with Eddie McParland, our very great friend in Dublin, and he, he was... Um, 
he was talking about humanism being at the core of architecture through time, and that that uh, the role. I'm not. I'm. I'm probably misinterpreting, but what I was really struck by, and it was after the conversation yesterday, that um, if you take Alberti, you know, humanism was at the core of Alberti's agenda, let's say. And that very often people think about history and historians as being simply about a kind of mapping uh, uh, time, let's say, but it's also mapping, I suppose, the history of humanism in a way. And it's very interesting to put it, put, put it in that context because I would say we've, it's one of the things, Yvonne, we've often spoken about is that um, we went to see, I remember we went to see a building in, in Milan, a building from the 60s, when we were doing the Bocconi University, and it's by um, Mandarati, and it's a, it's a small apartment building, uh, a little tower. But there was something about the way the building was made, the kind of um, almost tender attention to the way that somebody comes home and where they leave their shopping bag and how they open the door and, and how they enter their, their home. And we just felt that that, that that component was absent, actually, in a lot of contemporary architecture. And we realized that some buildings lack the humanistic component altogether. And, and that's kind of shocking. And that's why some, um, let's say, buildings feel cold and alienating, because they don't have the humanistic agenda at the core. And it goes back to that thing of the uh, architecture being an, expressive, an expression of of those core elements. And when you remove them, it's absent and it's really problematic. I don't know if, I'm, if you agree. I'd like to continue the discussion in relation to teaching. And yesterday I was having a conversation with someone uh, quoting the, um, we quoted the Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran, who talks about parenting, that, that we are the, the bow and they are the arrow. And I think that when you think of a school, you cannot conceive of a school of medicine uh, where there were no surgeons training new surgeons and they could just take a body and have a bit of fun with somebody's amputation of leg. And that I think that, that medicine is taught in a certain way that people have, if you like, experience that they want to share. And I think that teaching, I mean, today when we were coming into the, to the uh, corderie, there was a, a, a professor with his teacher, with his students, and they make the trip from their various schools to come to the Biennale to try and have some sort of coherent discussion with their students. I think that schools of architecture are places uh, where the future is in careful hands, people trying to explain the reality of now so that students who will live into 50, 60, 100 years from now, that they have the tools and that they have the, the value system that's shareable. And I think that the, the thing of teaching is that it's, uh, I don't know whether uh, she's in the audience, but when uh, Kate Goodwin invited us to, to participate in Sensing Spaces in, in, the, in, the, in London, some years ago, um, Kate, who's an architect, asked us as architects to, uh, to uh, communicate with the public in, in, a, in, a, in a way that wasn't architectural building. And we found that really very difficult thing to do. And it was kind of in a, uh, a vacuum and in a, in a void in the beginning. But then we decided that she was giving us these two beautiful rooms that were rooflit, that we would really just talk about uh, light and darkness. And that I think that what architectural teachers try to do is to strip back the complexity of architecture to something that's legible to another generation so that that generation can take up a baton and continue with their struggles and their ambitions to really value this thing. It's like a little flame, it's a language. And when you talk about the, the project in, in Milan, uh, what was amazing was that Milan had such a strength of city had such a strength of, of a, a client, and by making models and drawings and saying, yes, that might work, no, that mightn't work, that process of making and doing and being in the struggle, I think that architects need to share. I think one of the, the problems about architectural education, certainly in, in our education, is that buildings kind of came complete. 
So this, this was a complete building. And there was no, uh, if you like, uh, or very little trail back to the initial idea and the struggle to get from a sketch to the making, to the construction, to the living, with and also hearing about its mistakes. I think we don't admit enough our mistakes as well because we take the photographs and run away. And that sometimes we need to sit and understand that, that as architects, and especially with students, it's hard to admit mistakes, but you can say that water splashes up that high. You can say that water rises. I mean, I'm amazed being here in, in Venice in a city where you have to buy these protections for your feet because the ocean or the sea might come up here or it might drop. It's just an incredible idea for students not only to come here to Venice to see the Biennale, but to see nature coming up and down their legs and to have to deal with that and eat a pizza in a, in a restaurant where the waiters are serving you pizza over the, the Adriatic is lapping on your knees. It's just incredible that, that, that problems that you would see in paper. In the end, the Venetians just walk past you as if there's nothing wrong. I find that incredibly brave, that it's a lesson in reality being not so terrifying. If you described... <laughs> It's crazy, isn't it? You're sitting here in the Adriatic. You're wondering whether the foyer of your hotel is going to be one meter below sea level. It's ridiculous. If you said in urban planning terms, Paolo, we're going to build a city over a kind of a forest of timber on mud islands in the sea, and we're going to make it beautiful, and thousands of people are going to come every year. <laughs> it's crazy. This is disenchantment and utopia. <laughs> or utopia. No, the best, the best piece of, of news I got recently, I thought this was really funny, in countries where they have flooding and they used to raise chickens, they've changed to ducks. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I call optimism. <laughs> This is a serious conversation, guys. Should we laugh? <laughs> fifth, fifth, and final chapter, for, at, least, <laughs> at least for me. <laughs> uh, well, since the the final chapter is dedicated to, oh my God, what have we been doing? in these six months. What is our heritage? What is, what have we been adding? What should be, what should the Biennale make of this for a future? Uh, what have we achieved? Challenges that might uh, be underlined as relevant after this Biennale for the coming Biennales. I mean, what we always see the chain of Biennales as a permanent research, as a permanent exercise in, in research and deepening. The, so since it's a chapter that might start and might not end, uh, I, uh, you can shoot your questions within uh, while discussing this argument, these topics. If you have any questions that I target, Targeted uh, for the answer. Just a very simple question. Who's going to be the next architecture curator? I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> a bit soon, is it? Yeah. Okay. No. Um, I was interested in um, the discussion that came up yesterday <clears throat> about the role of culture and um, Mary Robinson's suggestion that culture uh, in become engaged, actively engaged in um, the situation that we're in right now in relation to the condition of the world, let's say. And we briefly discussed this 
last evening, and you have a very particular idea about the role of culture, not just in relation to the Biennale, but in your view of the world, let's say, your view of the political and economic world. And I just think it would be interesting to make a comment on that, if you would make a comment on that. Well, uh, the, the word culture has been abused in recent times. I mean, we don't know even the border of, of the meanings or different meanings that this word has. We have put it into the, the pot, many different aspects of life. Nowadays, the UNESCO provides to give a target, aim, 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 uh, to, to, is asked to give a, recognize the pizza as a endowment of the world, yeah, the, as a cultural, cultural sort of contribution to the world. So, I mean, uh, when we use the word culture, we should at least say wh what sort of border, what sort of uh, meaning we attribute to it, what we include in this word. What I can say is that culture is once again uh, a word that might have a double aspect. Duality is always here. Culture is, from the individual point of view, from the vita contemplativa of the individuals, is the sum of what we are and what we have learned and what we, are, we keep. But if we go beyond that and we consider culture as, a, in terms of the social life, the world in which we live, and we, get, we talk frequently about our culture, as communities, as nations, as well. In that case, I think that I have only one definition for it. It's that culture is the quality of our actions, uh, and as as group, as nations, as societies, as communities, action is the way in which culture does manifest herself and exist. Even, even heritage, you have to take actions and you, the taking the care of for your heritage reveals your culture because it's an action towards protection, towards uh, knowledge, towards research and so on and so forth. So the quality of our action is my, I uh, would, uh, confine, and not go beyond that. I mean, so the quality of our action, of our everyday action, this, this dualism somehow re repeats the dualism between culture and civilization, but it's not exactly that, that, that way. Um, and um, the, to have a quality of action, which means that we have to act, uh, culture, is not in those who don't take actions. Uh, to take action means to face the complexity of life. There is no culture where you avoid or deny complexity. So it's, um, nowadays we are sometimes pushed by different interests and different affairs to consider, to, to try to, to, to push to reduce the degree of complex, uh, complexity that we attach to our life and to the life of human beings and to squeeze the problems into very, the sort of simplicity, out, out, yes or no, short term and not long term. Uh, when you consider the direct immediate effects of your actions 
and you don't care about the long-term effect of your actions or the external effect of your actions. I mean, this, if you just consider that any action has an immediate effect, a postponed effect, and an external effect, that already gives you a, a triangle of complexity of life. And any action has to be considered from all its possible effects on us and on those who live with us. And this is the growing, the, co the contribution of culture, developing the capability of seeing beyond the immediate effects of what we do and improving our capability to see and to understand and to consider the indirect effects of what we do and the external effects of what you do. What we do. So it's, um, a culture is uh, giving to our understanding of life all this multidimensional uh, uh, scheme, a sort of uh, uh, method. method. Um, so it's uh, once again the architecture. Uh, what is architecture if not facing the complexity of this place in which we live and act? In, to, towards the, rea the realization of both the private space, the public space, because architecture, while you build, you build both at the same time. And outside, inside, uh, for me, for them, for the half of me, for the half of you, and for the future generations. So the free space is not only for us, Free space is a heritage that we live. And the heritage that to which we should attach the greatest importance, learning from the past, but we should be proud of the heritage that we live to those who will come after us. So once again, that's our challenge. That is the challenge that for, for our culture to demonstrate that we were capable of facing the complexity of our times act with courage and give results that reveal our capability of seeing beyond our immediate interest or immediate effects of our action. Wow. So you can stop. Uh, yesterday I wanted to ask the question but but didn't, but it was really quoting an indigenous leader from the Amazon territory, uh, a person called Sonia Guajajara. And she said, our fight is the mother of all fights, the fight for Mother Earth. And she was responding to the newly elected president in Brazil, uh, Bolsonaro, his announcement that he was going to combine the Ministry of Environment and Agriculture, effectively removing the normal checks and balances to help protect the Amazon forest. And when uh, I mentioned this to uh, Mary Robinson last night, it was very interesting, a discussion. Uh, it was kind of, don't worry too much, uh, Yvonne, this was essentially that, because there's a kind of a belief in, in people, and there was a discussion about uh, the changing personnel in Ethiopia and that countries are changing for the better because of the power of people. And I would like to say that it's been uh, our absolute privilege to work with the Biennale team uh, and our team itself, but the Biennale team is an extraordinary phenomenon. And what the Biennale, it's just interesting, I was just going through this notebook and there are two pieces of the many pieces of wisdom that the participants have shared with us and with the community of architects. And one of them is, is from Frederick Bonnet and following on what you have said, uh, Paolo, he talks about architecture as the century, centuries old discipline, a corpus of fertile, unfathomable unfathom complexity, which involves constant investigation to address ever evolving world in which economics, environmental and social demands, and they demand uh, appropriate responses. And then further back in the notebook, I just found these beautiful words by Peter Rich, the South African architect, two pieces which, I, uh, which are 
Well, one is a beautiful drawing of the way the sun is in South Africa, but two things. He says, when you draw, you can go to places you've never been. And the other quote is, I draw as part of a search to find the way. And I think that when you talk about culture and sharing and the community, I suppose, of architects, is that when you read even three or four words of the wisdom of other people, I think that what we feel is that around the world there are these brave, uh, hard-working, talented and skilled people who are trying to share. And that's what the Biennale seems to... It's like a, a platform uh, on which people leave these, uh, uh, if you like, um, offerings to be taken up or ignored, as the case may be. But they are some of those pieces, they're like... Uh, I often read in Trinity College, they put up uh, quotations from Edmund Burke, the great uh, Irish statesman. And some of those statements are profound truths that somebody of that intelligence can parcel in 10 words, but they are like armor to, to help, uh, if you like, to, to move towards utopia. That it's, I think that what is amazing is that of all the people in the Biennale, they have laid a gift at Venice's uh, shore or a table, whatever the expression is. But there's something about trying to uh, have a community of architects explain the complexity and ever-changing. That's what's interesting about Frederick, uh, uh, Frederick Boyer's, uh, Bonnet's description, the ever-changing nature of architecture, that it's not a static thing, that it needs to be, uh, if you like, defined, not quite every day, but the, the duality of the Biennale is very interesting because it's like this great, what is it? Because, I mean, we're in practice 40 years and it's very hard to define what is it. We just know that it is amazing. And as we build more and more, especially that's why we put in the Earth as client, in, as the years progress, there are more and more people in built environments. And what was fantastic yesterday with Tiziana, what she was saying, yes, people will live in cities, but they'll also live in countryside. So it's really, a, I think what has been fantastic for us is that there's the beautiful seat that we had in the first press release, which is the seat outside the door of uh, Can Lease in, in Mallorca by uh, Utzen, which is just a piece of concrete and just some tiles. But because he was a gifted architect, he made them like silk and satin. That was his gift. And then from the earth as client, it's, it's keeping the Atlantic Ocean out of Manhattan. And how do you deal with that? So the span of what architects have to do is enormous. And I think what we feel is that the Biennale can be the, the, uh, the round table on which these items can be discussed in the full spectrum of what architecture is. It's not technology, it's not this, it's not that, it is everything together. And the difficulty in representing architecture is that it is everything. So you have to, it's like a, if we were a cookery, if we were, you know, the great British Bake Off, uh, it would be the, how do you put the ingredients? And I think the working together between our team and the Biennale team, and as uh, we witness the British flag being lowered from the EU this afternoon on the television, it's a sad thing when people don't work together. What we have found with your professionalism, uh, Italy, and, uh, and, and our essentially Irish team, but also uh, Italian team, it's been amazing. When you get the right people in the right place, it's fantastic. It's a fantastic, it's hard work, but a fantastic thing happens when people work together for an ideal. And I think that that's what the Biennale, the Venice Biennale, we don't know about the art, but the architecture, it's an ideal. How do you represent it in modern society so that it's valued? And I, I must say, I think it's true for both Shelley and I and our team, that having worked on your request, our respect for the discipline of architecture is even higher than before because you witness around the world that there are people trying to make work which has meaning. And I, I think it's been an amazing experience for us and we thank you for it. Well... Can, can I... Uh, can I just say if you can decipher a question out of that it would be good because Yvonne's idea of a question is interesting. Well, the, que the, <laughs> question, the, <laughs> question, the question is the question that I'm putting to myself now after this Yvonne's okay. speech is uh, uh, 
don't you think that after all, generosity is also the main rule for a cultural institution? And uh, because you were asking questions about culture, but now we have, we, know, we have to answer a question of what is a cultural institution, not only culture in general. And uh, if we are here, and if we do uh, have, have been hosting all these people coming without knowing what they are going to see, or what they find, and uh, if, they have con if they are here to spend their time with us, and uh, they are happy to listen to you and to consider this place as a place where you, some relevant exchange can take place in terms of knowledge is because, possibly because they trust us. So for a cultural institution, the main uh, aim is to conquer, maintain through time the trust of others. To be trusted is the sole currency by which you measure the value produced by a cultural institution. There is no other way of, I don't know how to, I have a balance sheet of course, I try to, to be in balance, I try to find money, and, but I, I try to find money to spend it, but in the end, if one has to measure the real product of a cultural institution, the token, the, 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 the has to be, is just the amount of trust that you feel the world has towards you and your values, which again is to be uh, considered, which again lead us once again to culture in terms of production of culture, cultural activities. Uh, they have to, given the fact that they have to conquer their specific trust, they have to show that they are not moved by any other aim than the one they proclaim. There is no hidden aim, hidden purpose, hidden purpose. So there is no other end, if not the artistic end, and aim in the Biennale of Art. There is no other end but the dialogue on ourselves, which is a Biennale of Architecture, uh, which means to be autonomous, autonomous from power, autonomous from money, from all, from all those desires that might lead our work towards different aims and different ends. And uh, why I'm insisting on this concept of desire? Because we are surrounded by subjects who invest money to induce us to desire something and to consume something, to act in, some, in this or that way, to behave in this or that way. I mean, we are surrounded and the Internet uh, appeared to be a free space of freedom. Uh, through internet, there are floods of conformism coming towards us. Uh, so, I mean, this, uh, we are surrounded by tribes and armies and weapons that want us to desire something. We have to fight against this with the sword of desire, we desire something else. We desire not our, just our security or just our personal wellness, we desire free space. With an extension of, our, of the quality of our desires, and it's an extension of our idea of welfare. Uh, so, once again, trust, autonomy, desire, uh, free dialogue. I mean, these are the words that are the why people, are, why you, your team and our team are so enthusiastic about what they do. Because they feel clearly that they have a purpose. They have a sort of clear aim. And the cultural institution has no incentives 
for for people who work with 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 us. No specific incentives in terms of uh, of power or money. So they have to to be really pushed by that sort of enthusiasm that um, is possible only if you have a clear idea of your purpose, of your mission. Hmm? So it's, uh, I thank you for your uh, words for the people working in the Biennale I th and for the t your team and this seems to me to be the greatest conclusion of all that we have been working with pleasure, with a sense of freedom, with the sense of the, we, the, this is an opportunity to implement a free dialogue among us and we can be proud of and therefore we are, we have the courage to be in front of an audience of young people, of many young people, accepting the challenge of your being here and proud of what we have been doing. Thank you very much. Thank you.